Well, a good Friday morning to you and welcome to Real Talk. I'm Ryan Jesperson. We've got a great show for you coming up in the next uh, couple of hours, including a Real Talk roundtable. That's our tradition. Every Friday here on this broadcast, we bring intelligent, compelling people with lived experience together. We take on issues that really matter, and, and I have no doubt that we're all going to take something important away from the discussion today around uh, tangible action, citizen action, societal perspectives on addressing discrimination in our communities. And we've got uh, three real movers and shakers that are going to be joining us just after the 9 o'clock headlines. That's coming up, of course. We'll say it'll kick off in about 35 minutes from now. Between now and then, uh, the Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson, he's Canada's uh, federal environment and climate change minister, will join us. We're going to be talking about the carbon tax. We're going to talk about uh, mining in the Bighorn region of the Canadian Rockies uh, right here in in southwestern Alberta. We're going to talk about President-elect Joe Biden, his inauguration coming up on January 20th. What does that mean for the Keystone XL pipeline? What's on the radar of the federal government? Plus other questions as submitted by you to our hashtag RealTalkRJ on Twitter and, of course, the comments that are no doubt already underway on our live YouTube broadcast. As we say good morning to everybody, uh, those of you that join us each and every morning for our live broadcast right there by subscribing to our YouTube channel. We're going to be getting uh, going with Canada's Environment Minister in just a couple of minutes, but first want to remind you that we're very uh, grateful to be partnering up with Bitcoin Well. That's the title sponsor of this program, and it's been a big week for everybody that holds Bitcoin. I've been hearing from my buddies Rod and 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 Bins and other guys that have invested and they've said, uh, hey, have you been paying attention to what's going on this week? And I'm going, uh-huh, yeah, I have. Uh, m- maybe I should hold a little bit more Bitcoin considering what it's doing right now. Adam O'Brien, the founder and CEO of Bitcoin Wells, having some fun with it. I told you he just released his new clothing line. It just says, I told you so. And you can find that on their website. Pretty funny. Cheeky stuff. If you've held Bitcoin for a long time, you've held Bitcoin for a few years. You really told everybody so, didn't you? Anyway, of course, we don't guarantee any investment on this show. And don't listen to me for your investment advice. But if you're looking for information on Bitcoin, you can talk to the team at Bitcoin Well and simply follow the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com. You'll see their logo, the big, huge one right at the top of the page. That's how you can track them down. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, sometimes we'll begin the broadcast with some small talk. We'll ease into the morning, and and, and sometimes the rubber hits the road, the tires smoke, and we get going right away. And that's the case right now because uh, Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change has made himself available to us, the Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson. We appreciate him making time for us. Uh, Minister, welcome to Real Talk. Uh, you're, You're addressing here, you know, an audience of engaged Albertans who want to talk about the carbon tax. So, So I hope you're ready to go. Okay. Well, an announcement from the Prime Minister just a short time ago, uh, as a matter of fact, a week ago today, uh, you yourself as well, part of that announcement indicated that that, uh, the federal government will seek to put uh, Canada on track to cut greenhouse gas emissions uh, by as much as 40 percent as compared to 2005 levels uh, versus the current 30 percent goal uh, central to achieving that as your government has announced an increase uh, to the carbon price to one hundred and seventy dollars per metric ton by twenty. 30 already on track to hit $50 a ton two years from now it'll increase by 15 bucks a year after that it has raised the ire of uh, many westerners including western premiers uh, premier jason kenny premier scott mo what's the justification you know who you're talking to this morning let's hear the pitch <laughs> all right sure um so the the climate plan that we announced i know that the the price on pollution has gotten most of the attention in the media but it was a comprehensive plan there are a whole range of investments that are focused on enabling companies to actually make the kinds of investments they need to make to reduce their carbon emissions and ultimately to become more competitive in a world that is moving to lower carbon there are a number of regulatory tools and then of course there is an increase on the price on pollution um, you know, it's important for Canada to do its part internationally to address the uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, that is not getting worse. The costs associated with climate change are getting bigger every year. But it's also important in the context of a world that is moving to a lower carbon future. And the investment community is very clear about this, that uh, investments are being seen through a, a low carbon lens, that Canada actually ensures its, its economy is going to be competitive in the future. And, um, and uh, that is, uh, you know, been 
the case with respect to Europe and China for some time, but now it's increasingly the case with our friends to the south who will be taking bold action. Uh, you know, I, I, the price on pollution, and I know it's a controversial issue on the prairies. I mean, I grew up in Saskatchewan. All my family lives in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, the, the price on pollution is the most efficient way to reduce emissions. Um, nine out of ten economists will tell you it's the most efficient way to do that, and it incents innovation. And it, it does it in an affordable way. I, I do find some of the comments of, of some of the premiers a bit unfortunate because I'm not sure that they've been entirely accurate about how it works. You know, the money stays in Alberta, that's raised in Alberta, goes back to Alberta citizens. The majority of Alberta families are actually better off than they would be if there was no price on pollution. So some of the comments that, that uh, my colleagues you know, at the provincial level have made are, are a bit misleading, I think. Well, we, so we've titled the show Real Talk on purpose because we're committed to just digging in and having meaningful conversations. So, so what are some of the comments or, or what, what are at le- what's at least the premise of some of the comments that you've seen from provincial leaders that you take issue with? I mean, let's hit them head on. Well, uh, the primary one uh, that, that certainly we've heard from some um, is, is that uh, the price on pollution makes life unaffordable, that it's going to cost people a lot of money at the pumps or in the heating uh, costs for their homes. And, and I would tell you that that's just simply not true. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the federal government rebates all of the money. The majority of families are actually better off, not even equal, they're better off. Um, than they would be if the price on pollution was not in place. Um, so, so the issue around affordability, and, and the money is rebated up front. Right now it's rebated once a year. We've committed by 2022 that we will be moving to quarterly rebates, um, such that people are getting money every quarter up front to defer, you know, to, to defer the cost associated with the price. But the price has to act as a price signal. It, it, it basically gets people to, it incents people to choose lower carbon technologies to look at how they can save energy, um, and it actually affects greenhouse gas emissions in a significant way. And that's, you know, that's very clear in, in countries around the world that have implemented price on pollution. Can I can it just for those that are listening to this and saying, hang on a second, like how how is this? It, it, it almost feels like a one of these vacation property pitches where, you know, they, they pay for your round of golf and then they sit you down. And by the end of it, you're going, how, how, how am I making it makes this doesn't make any sense at all. People are going to sit here and go, wait a second. I'm, I'm paying more at the pumps. I'm paying more to heat my home. And, and we'll talk about ag uh, and farmers and drying grain and all those things in just a second. But people are going to go, hang on. So I'm paying into the carbon tax. The federal government's telling me I'm going to be better off. In other words, I'm going to make money off of this thing. So so how are we actually accomplishing anything? Can, can you really dumb it down? to like our coffee shop level and explain to us how that works and, and how it's effective if people actually make more than they pay? Sure. Um, I guess a couple things. The first is, I mean, the basic premise behind um, the price on pollution is, uh, particularly as it escalates, um, people will make choices about the fuel efficiency of the cars that they drive or the, that they will take public transit in place of driving a car. Um, it, they, they will think about the kind of, of heating that they have in their home so that it, they may look at a heat pump, for example, to improve the efficiency or put in new windows to ensure that they are actually lowering their heating bills. It incents certain actions that actually drive down emissions. But, but the whole point of this and the reason why I always uh, you know, argue with folks who t- call it a carbon tax is a tax is actually something that governments levy and then they take the money and they spend it. That's not the case in the price on pollution. We, we collect the money and then we return it. 90% of it goes back to Canadian households. I, I didn't say that everybody is better off. Um, the majority of Canadian families are better off. Some folks are, are basically net zero. It, but, you know, and some people do pay a bit more. Typically, those who have very large houses to heat that, that drive very, uh, you know, high gas using uh, vehicles, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, but in general, the majority of Canadian families are better off, and particularly those on more modest income. I want to, uh, uh, Sam, if you could pull up Premier Kenny's tweet from yesterday. Minister Wilkinson, I'm not sure if you saw this. This was a Twitter thread from the Premier yesterday. The, the culmination of it, he promises Albertans uh, a referendum next October uh, on scrapping equalization. Uh, the position of this broadcast and the position of the person talking is that it's a waste of money, it's completely meaningless, and it's political theater. But that's not the purpose of my question to you. Uh, my question to you is uh, Premier Kenny asserting that uh, premiers have unanimously supported a request to fix a broken system, he says, which has Alberta supporting Canada in tough times only to have Ottawa turn its back on Alberta when we need support. Now, this is part of a 
bigger picture or bigger position taken by this Alberta government that asserts that essentially, I mean, if I can put it in in casual terms, Ottawa is trying to kill the oil and gas sector. So in the context of our conversation today about the carbon tax, how will the federal government work with the oil and gas sector to ensure that that is not the case? Well, we've been working very actively with the oil and gas sector. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, for example, the Alberta Business Council had urged us to look at using the price on pollution and escalating it rather than using regulatory tools, which typically are more expensive. Um, we certainly work with many of the energy companies in Alberta on an ongoing basis and actually have a very active collaboration with many of them. Um, I do think that at times there's a little bit too much political theater, um, and, and I don't just blame the Kenny government. I'm sure that's true on all sides um, on, on some of these questions. We are very focused on ensuring that all regions of the country will be successful. Look, I, I grew up on the prairies. I mean, I am very firmly of the view that it is, it is the role of the federal government to ensure that all regions and all people who live in all regions of the country have economic opportunity. And certainly the climate plan that we announced was about partnering with Alberta and with other parts of this country on trying to determine and, and define pathways to economic success. What, what do your text messages look like, your personal ones from your friends, from your like longtime friends that work in ag or that work in energy in Alberta and Saskatchewan with announcements like these. I mean, there are the things that people say to you on Twitter, members of the public. What do your old school chums say to you? <laughs> well, uh, look, I, I used to I used to run clean tech companies. Um, one of the clean tech companies I used to run uh, was in the hydrogen space, and and our largest investor was uh, was Shell, and our largest uh, development partner was Exxon Mobil. Um, so I know a lot of folks who work in and around the energy space. Um, and, and I would tell you that the thoughtful people in the energy space are aware that we need to make, uh, you know, we need to make uh, progress with respect to climate. At the end of the day, anybody who wants to go out and raise money in the international environment is very clear that they must have a credible climate plan. And, uh, and I would say that certainly in terms of engagement going forward on issues around things like the, the Keystone Pipeline with the, the new Biden administration once in office, it, it, it is going to require a credible climate plan, not only on the part of Canada, but on the part of Alberta and Saskatchewan and British Columbia. Um, if, if we're going to have a, a constructive conversation with, uh, with President-elect Biden. If you're uh, just tuning in right now, live listening on Mixler, we're speaking with uh, Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson. Uh, Minister, how, how much outside influence, uh, you know, helps form this policy or shapes this policy? I mean, you don't have to look far. Uh, you, you know, you'll find BlackRock CEO uh, Lawrence Fink on the record uh, talking about pulling investment away from traditional energy. Uh, Warren Buffett, people may have heard of him. People may have heard of Mark Carney. Uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, big stories. French giant Total divesting itself, writing off some assets in, in Canada's oil sands. And we know that President-elect Joe Biden has insisted that he'll rejoin the Paris Accord that President Trump left. He says that America will be net zero emissions by 2050, which is an ambitious goal if ever there was one. How much does outside influence, I'm talking outside of Canada's borders, play into Canadian energy policy? Well, outside influence in the sense of watching what is going on in the international environment certainly has to play into both energy policy and economic policy. I mean, you know, look, around the world, it's very clear that international capital, you talked about Larry Fink at BlackRock, he is one of many, many, many CEOs now who have made uh, the assessment of, of projects and investment opportunities contingent on, on uh, companies addressing climate risk. So, of course, we're sensitive to that because ultimately, Canada's prosperity in the future depends on us having an economy that can compete in a world which is a world of low carbon. So low carbon products, low carbon technologies and services are going to be critically important. So we certainly are, are live to that. I mean, at the end of the day, climate change is an environmental threat for every country in the world, but it is going to form the basis of economic competition. Our, our friends to the south are going to be our partners on addressing the climate, the environmental climate issue, but they are going to be our economic competitors with respect to, to generating prosperity in a low carbon world. And, and we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, the competition is going to ramp up with President-elect Biden coming into office. 
Minister, I want to I want to uh, take a second. To, this this is a portion of a, a quite a lengthy email we received, and I want to spend some time. I'm going to spend about two minutes reading it to you because it's a thoughtful presentation from somebody. Uh, his name is James. He's a farmer in Vegreville, and I want to establish his credibility here before I get to his question. It's a thoughtful question. I know that you're going to appreciate. He says, since hearing last Friday uh, about proposed increases to the carbon tax, I've been absolutely reeling. He says, to give you a sense, uh, I run a six thousand acre grain farm with my brother and my dad. Uh, they produce canola, wheat, oats, barley, yellow peas. He said we produce about 10,000 metric tons of grain for perspective. Uh, that's enough calories to feed about 35,000 people. <clears throat> he says, I'm also a mechanical engineer. And prior to returning to the farm, I worked a few years for a bioenergy company. He's got his PNG, and he continues to practice engineering as an independent consultant in the areas of renewable energy and carbon credits. So he knows what he's talking about. He says, as producers and exporters of commodities, our prices are set by world markets, and we have no way to pass these increased costs on to consumers. He says, in general, I agree with the principle of carbon taxes, effectively allowing the market to find solutions to lower greenhouse gas emissions, and I don't have a problem paying them personally as a consumer, but there are some industries like agriculture and other commodity exporters where it just doesn't work. He says if it discourages agricultural production in Canada through higher input costs, it will simply shift to other grain producing regions, Brazil, Argentina, Ukraine, Russia, not subjected to carbon taxes. If the net result is that Canada grows less grain and Brazil cuts down more of the Amazon rainforest so they can make up for it, is that really what we're trying to accomplish? He says, now, while farm fuel like dyed gasoline and diesel are currently exempt from the tax, there are many other ways that farms are impacted, like natural gas use, heating our barns, drying our grain, running generators, all of the other examples. He says, I'd appreciate if you would please ask the minister for if an exemption for grain drying is coming. He says the use of these systems is key for farmers that are adapting to changing weather patterns caused by climate change as they allow harvest to proceed through inclement weather. He says the parliamentary budget officer has estimated that a $50 a ton carbon tax, $60 million per year will be collected from farmers simply for energy used in grain drying. At $170 a ton, that'll be more than $200 million a year. He says according to Statistics Canada, Canada's grain and oilseed farms collectively earned net profits of $1.3 billion in 2019. $200 million in carbon tax for drying grain would represent a 15% reduction in net farm income. He says, please ask the minister what Ottawa will do about this and if an exemption for grain drying is coming. That's from Jonathan, uh, Darren, pardon me, uh, you're Jonathan. That's from Darren in Vegreville, Alberta. Sure. Uh, so look, I, uh, I certainly understand that the grain drying issue is, a, is a, an important one for the agricultural community. As, as, your, uh, your, um, as the fellow noted, um, on-farm fuels, on-farm liquid fuels are already exempt, but we do understand that the grain drying issue has been uh, one that has created challenges for the farming community. And, and so we are looking at how can we address that. Um, one option uh, is an exemption. Um, that, of course, creates challenges with respect to uh, many other communities asking for similar exemptions. Um, but, but it's certainly something we're looking at. The other option is to look at, at programming, which some of which we've already done, which is to help farmers to actually implement high efficiency grain dryers, which would probably save more money than the cost associated with the price on pollution. But this is an issue that we recognize is an important one for the agricultural community, and it is something that we are act actively looking at. Uh, I want to ask you, Minister, about your perspective. You know, we referenced the United States, the incoming administration, uh, President-elect Biden and his lofty climate goals. There's also, I suppose, some trepidation here in Alberta that a Biden administration may kill the Keystone XL pipeline. I don't have to tell you that the province of Alberta invested heavily uh, in this pipeline. Now, I've seen many speculate that that's not actually happening, that that was politicking, that Biden needed to keep the, the more left-leaning uh, communities uh, part of his base and that really there's no way this pipeline project is killed. What's the position of the federal government and what balls are in play and what's your message to Albertans that have a keen interest in the completion of this pipeline? Well, I mean, the government of Canada continues to support the construction of the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and in fact, when Prime Minister Trudeau had his first conversation with President-elect Biden, that was one of the subjects that he raised. Um, so we, de we definitely continue to be supportive. We will be raising it in the context of our bilateral conversations with the Americans. 
But I, I do think it's important that people understand. I mean, President-elect Biden made a, a commitment that he was not going to proceed with this. So we are going to have to be thoughtful about how we engage conversations with him and with his administration about why he should change his mind publicly. And, and I think that, you know, the, the, the best chance that we have in terms of, uh, of advocating on behalf of the pipeline is to ensure that Canada has a robust address, a plan to address the climate issue, which is essentially tied into this decision, that the Alberta government has a robust plan to address the climate issue, that part of that involves decreasing the carbon intensity of fuels that are going to be flowing through that pipeline, such that we can, we can argue very legitimately that, this, uh, that the pipeline is part of an overall plan to reduce emissions over time. And, uh, and I do think that that's a conversation that we can have with the, uh, the Biden administration. But it does require, A, the climate plan that we announced on Friday, and, and B, it, it requires, I think, continued active partnership between the province of Alberta and the government of Canada. Uh, Minister Wilkinson, depending on who you talk to, this is a story that's either flying under the radar here in Alberta or forefront in people's minds, depending, I think, on their environmental awareness. I don't have to tell you that about six months ago, the Alberta government rescinded Alberta's coal policy, which allowed for an expansion of approved territory for, for coal mining just north, about 60 kilometers north of the Crow's Nest Pass in the Bighorn in Alberta's south west corner uh what's your position and, and and what specific thoughts do you have around expanded coal mining uh in the southwestern corner of alberta's rocky mountains well i would say uh you know it's up to the government of alberta to manage um these kinds of resource developments within their areas of jurisdiction um as, as you probably know, uh, once they hit certain thresholds, they become a matter of federal interest. So that's uh, sometimes it's the size or the, the amount of disturbance of a project. Um, it also is if there are going to be impacts on areas of federal jurisdiction, so species at risk, uh, migratory birds, fish, et cetera. Um, there is one of these projects that actually has, uh, has hit those thresholds. Uh, some of the others have not. And so, you know, ultimately, uh, much of this is up to the government of Alberta. But I would say, as, as somebody who, uh, who very much enjoys the wild spaces, I think that those wild spaces are pretty important in the context of the work that we as Canadians have been doing to try to stem the decline in biodiversity and, and to protect species at risk, that opening up new areas um, to, uh, to ex exploitation of resources, um, you know, needs to be done in a very thoughtful way. Um, and I think, you know, many Canadians are very concerned about uh, particularly areas of high biodiversity, uh, if in fact we are going to be disturbing the species that live there. Um, because ultimately we are, we are one animal that lives on this planet. We can't continue to, uh, to uh, make extinct uh, many species as, as we have been doing as a human race over the past 40 years. My disclosure here is that I don't have specific numbers in front of me. I've only seen speculation, and it may just be that, uh, that one of the areas where the federal government could potentially fall into the mix here might be the export of the coal that's mined out of Alberta. It seems to be suggested by some people. I've seen some industry experts in British Columbia over the past couple of days talk about limits on the ports and 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 obviously a potential need for expansion, which likely would not happen, I would suspect, based on what we've seen typically with environmental-related expansion. I see an interesting uh, tweak there to your facial expression. Do you have some insight into that and whether or not this may be an issue that actually matters or it actually comes into fruition? Well, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one is that there, there definitely uh, are, are proposals to expand the capacity of the ports. Uh, certainly the Port of Prince Rupert has, has lots of plans in terms of being able to more fully utilize the infrastructure there. But the Port of Vancouver also has a proposal that is presently being reviewed by the federal government to expand port capacity. Um, I, I think that in terms of the export of coal, uh, most of the mines, as I understand them in, in, the, in the area that you're referring to, are, are what's called metallurgical coal, which is used to make steel. Um, that is different from thermal coal, which is used to generate electricity. There is, of course, a campaign internationally to eliminate the use of coal-fired power. We have committed to phasing out coal-fired power in Canada. We lead the international coalition to convince other countries to reduce uh, thermal coal. And so certainly there are questions about whether Canada should continue to export thermal coal. That is the subject of, of a strategic assessment that's going on now. Metallurgical coal is quite different, um, you know, until there is a, a clear substitute for, uh, for the use of metallurgical coal to make steel. Um, that will continue, obviously, to, to, to go on. Um, and, and I'm not sure that port capacity is, is the really limiting factor there. 
Let me ask you, uh, and I'll, I'll note that we're up against the clock. I know you have a commitment coming up in, in, in about six minutes' time here, so we'll make this the final question, unless it demands a follow-up. Uh, <laughs> a a two-part question here. Number one, I, I know that there are funds here as part of this plan to retrofit people's homes, which I think people will, will be particularly interested in. I mean, we began the conversation talking about people taking steps to, to cut down on their personal contribution to emissions and being rewarded for that. Uh, if you could get into that. And then I'm also curious, as a sidebar, I mean, we spend so much time talking about the carbon tax. Uh, I saw an interesting piece in the Globe and Mail yesterday, as an aside, by Robin Urbach, a, a conservative writer, who said if Premier Scott Moe took coronavirus as seriously as he takes the carbon tax, there'd be zero cases there. I thought it was pretty interesting. There's a lot of focus on the carbon tax in Western provinces because it resonates with people. But that's not the entire environmental plan. So what else, including these funds to retrofit people's homes, what else... Uh, are you particularly excited about, or what do you want to make sure that people in these prairie provinces tuned in this morning are keenly aware of? Well, I think uh, some of the, the things that, that allow people to take action in their own lives are important. So you referenced the home retrofits, um, where it's a $5,000 grant for people to enhance the energy efficiency of their homes, which will ultimately reduce their, uh, their heating bills. Um, there's also continued support for building out uh, zero emission vehicle infrastructure um, and uh, subsidies for people to buy zero emission vehicles. Um, there's, there's money with respect to research and development. There's a lot of work going on in Alberta, actually, for heavy duty transportation um, in terms of how do you get to zero emission heavy duty vehicles, which is probably not electric. It's probably hydrogen, which uh, Alberta has hydrogen in abundance in, uh, in the natural gas resources that it has there. I think for Alberta, the fund for the development of low carbon fuels, which is biofuels, uh, which certainly is in, of interest to the agricultural community, but hydrogen, which is very of great interest to the energy sector, is a really important piece. And there's money there to partner with industry, with, with the oil and gas sector to help reduce emissions. That is something that the oil and gas sector asked us for uh, very, very actively. And, and finally, for your communities, I mean, for communities across the country, there's a fund to help municipalities to improve the energy efficiency of their hockey rinks and their curling rinks and their libraries. Uh, I know that's something I spoke to the mayors of both Edmonton and Calgary. I think that's something that's of great interest. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it is extremely important that, um, that all of the regions feel like they, their, their aspirations are being responded to by the federal government. I, you know, it, governments, gov governments do not simply govern on behalf of the people who voted for them. They have to govern on behalf of all Canadians. And we have to be sensitive to the needs and the aspirations of each region of the country. Each region is quite different. We certainly have listened very hard and we are actively engaging with people and with businesses in Alberta. And I will tell you that I personally, as somebody who grew up on the prairies, I am very committed to ensuring that we are, we are thinking very seriously about how we address and how we build a prosperous economy on the prairies. Quick follow-up. With regards to the electric vehicle market, or the alternative fuels, whatever you want to refer to it, to include all of the different types of hybrids and plug-ins and all those types of cars. Do you believe that government incentives, government rebates, create a false market for those vehicles? I mean, what's the justification for committing federal funds to that specific type of vehicle purchase or lifestyle decision for people? No, I don't. Um, we have to reduce the, uh, the carbon uh, emissions from transportation. Carbon emissions from transportation are 26 percent of uh, Canada's GHGs. You can't get to the kind of targets that have been established internationally without reducing um, the uh, the emissions from transportation. Part of that is through the clean fuel standard, which is about reducing the emissions intensity of the fuels. Part of it will be about uh, discussions around raising the efficiency standards for existing light and heavy duty vehicles, which we will likely be having with the Biden administration. Um, but part of it in the long term is about switching to non-emitting cars and trucks. And, uh, and right now, the cost associated with electric and hydrogen vehicles is a bit higher than internal combustion engines of a, of a similar model. So what we are doing is helping to come down that experience curve in the same way that, you know, wind and solar came down that experience curve. The cost reduce as you produce more. Uh, ultimately, subsidies won't be required. But this is about ensuring that we're actually getting the kind of deployment that will drive down costs. And that's really, really important. By 2050, we have to be in a position where all of the cars that we are driving are non-emitting. Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson is Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change. We appreciate your availability live on this Friday morning. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much. You bet.
you can let me know uh, what you make of what you just heard from the minister. We're getting a bunch of different comments, which is awesome. It just reiterates to me that our viewing and listening audience is a broad and diverse audience uh, coming uh, to each program and bringing on perspectives from, from different age brackets, from uh, rural and urban realities, uh, working in different industries. It means that we have a wonderfully robust perspective at play here. Uh, you know, Barry's uh, listening in. I happen to know that uh, Barry is a farmer himself. He works in ag, and he says, you know, the minister totally dodged uh, Farmer James's question there on the carbon tax. That was, that was a meaningless answer, essentially. Uh, meantime, you know, Christine wonders, has anybody actually studied the effect of people working from home on emissions she says i bet it's a huge change and probably good for everybody i mean christine geez just even think of the lack of commuting i mean think of how many cars have been pulled off the road i know two friends personally that sold their vehicles those are just two people i know and maybe i know more and don't even realize it they sold their vehicles in the past six months they're just not even not even using them anymore right uh d flange is watching in on youtube says a lot of oil companies are going clean on their own you know, this this tax may be pushing them towards it, but carbon tax is more of a cash cow than photo radar. Interesting. Chris says, you know, I'll be seeking federal and provincial grants to assist in upgrading elements to my carbon consuming life at home to ensure that this levy doesn't hit me that hard. You know, others are saying, you know, watch this. Uh, oh gosh, Rose had a great question here. Does the minister have any thoughts on oil companies walking away from obligations on capping oil wells? Rose, that's a great question. We'll get to that next time we talk to the minister. Penny's watching in. She says, oh, great. The federal government makes global commitments. Our provincial government pushes it right to the line without consequences. There's a lot to consider here, and a lot of you are chiming in, and we sure appreciate that. Uh, speaking of, of who and what we appreciate these days, uh, we probably don't have to tell you how much we appreciate the support of our sponsors that have joined us on this journey, building Real Talk to a formidable live show every morning, but the number one daily podcast in Canada before the one-month mark. How great is that? That includes Alta Storage, Alta Moving in Storage. In fact, uh, they're the... The proud providers of these pod-style containers, it's the new rage when it comes to moving or even short-term storage. Now, they've got the traditional storage lockers that you may need for short- or long-term storage, but the pod-style containers are the ones they drop off at your house. Uh, they can provide movers if you need, or you can do the work yourself. You maybe use those frog boxes that they have, the eco-friendly moving boxes. They transport it to the new location, you unload it, or they do it for you, and then they get that pod-style container out of there. More convenient for you, and you're dealing with a local company, so you don't have to deal with all those 1-800 phone calls to who knows where if you've got a problem. Alta Moving and Storage, you'll find the link on our website under sponsors at ryanjesperson.com. We're also grateful to have the support of Todd's Mechanical. This is one of those small businesses that we celebrate here across Canada, the movers and shakers. Todd himself used to work in the oil field, but he wanted to to spend more time with his family so he's now running what what he believes is edmonton's best plumbing and heating company i checked him out online the google ratings seem to agree the guy's a legend and he does furnace repair by the way so as the temperature continues to drop and your furnace is making those weird noises now is probably the time to give todd's mechanical a call at 780-499-7598 Sam, let's take a look at what's making news on this Friday morning. Here's a look at the headlines. Well, Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, calls it a heartbreaking number. Let's take a look at Alberta's COVID numbers. Yesterday, 30 deaths reported, bringing Alberta's total to 790 people who have lost their lives to COVID-19 since this pandemic touched down. Dina Hinshaw says, if anybody still needs reminding of the seriousness of the virus, the importance of restrictions currently in place and the importance of doing everything possible to limit our interactions and break the chains of transmission, this is it. So, I'm talking to you. If you're the one that's going to break the rules, hey, we get it. You're normally a law-abiding citizen, but you're like, nobody's keeping me from seeing grandma this Christmas. 763 Albertans in hospital, 138 of them in ICU, and a chief medical officer of health pleading with all of us to stay home. Let's do it. Let's do it for the people that are vulnerable. Let's do it for ourselves. We don't even realize we're vulnerable. Have you noticed that I've been bringing on COVID-19 patients, survivors, ones that have been in comas on ventilators that are like 36 years old, 
you know, 29 years old to prove a point that it can hammer down anybody. Meantime, Alberta expanding its rapid testing. Health Minister Tyler Shandro says mobile units are going to be at homeless shelters, long-term care facilities where positive cases will be identified in a matter of hours. It started this week. The pilot did in the Edmonton zone, Calgary zone. You can expect yours next week. An update on that Nova Scotia man who perpetrated Canada's worst and most horrific act of mass violence. The shooter that killed 22 people while we're learning more about his actions and his cash holdings after the CBC and other media outlets across Canada sought warrants, uh, sought essentially a court order, access to the warrant documents, typically public in Canada, but they have not been to this point. We learned yesterday that three days after those attacks, police discovered $705,000 in cash folded in tin foil, crammed into ammunition containers amidst the rubble of that gunman's burnt cottage in Portapique, Nova Scotia. We also wanted to introduce you to Ella Kesey Debra. If you don't know who she is, I'm going to warn you, you're going to see her beautiful smile here, and you're going to wonder why we're talking about her. Well, it's a tragic story. Sam, can you show us her picture? This is the nine-year-old girl that has become the first girl in the world to have pollution listed on her death certificate. That's seven years after the nine-year-old Londoner suffered a fatal asthma attack. Her death is making history. Just two days ago, coroner Philip Barlow ruled that air pollution killed the little girl. And we'll wrap up this break for the headlines on a positive note. You saw her on the show. You saw her just before her fight. She joined us Wednesday morning to talk about how she was feeling and defending her title down in Los Angeles. Well, check this out. Ladies and gentlemen, Edmonton's own Jelena Merdenovich. She is the greatest fighter in Canadian history, without a doubt, retained her title. She is and remains the champ and if you didn't see that interview of course you can download our podcast subscribe to it anywhere you find your podcast and of course you can also check out our youtube archives at our youtube channel and you'll be able to watch it there a remarkably powerful interview where hey man she bears it all she put her heart out and she just let us she gave us insight into what it's like to be fighting without her longtime trainer uh, milan lubovac who suffered cardiac arrest back in february Well, after the headlines, every Friday morning, we present the Real Talk Roundtable. And this morning, we welcome to the show three individuals with lived experience, but it doesn't stop there. These three individuals are taking remarkable steps in their own communities to impact positive change. We're going to talk about discrimination today and what we can do about it. I want to introduce Dr. Farah Sharif. She's the daughter of immigrants, as she says the mama to three bossy young women who will run the world one day. She's an academic and a professor. She's an expert in anti-racism at the University of Alberta. Her main role working with pre-service teachers in their understanding of culture, race, schooling, and curriculum. Uh, Dr. Sharif, welcome to Real Talk and thanks for making time for us today. Having me today is my daughter Sophia's birthday, so I'm going to say happy birthday to Sophia because they're having pancakes right now on the table. I love it. Mom's being introduced. Well, let me say happy birthday to Sophia as well, and let me also recognize your shirt. On Wednesday, we smashed the patriarchy. I love it. We'll let you get. That is a fantastic shirt. So you're putting it all out there. That's a great way to start the roundtable. Adam North Pagan, I consider to be a personal friend. Uh, Adam is indigenous from the Picani First Nation in southern Alberta, currently the national president for the Legacy of Hope Foundation in Ottawa. He's also the president of the 60s Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta. Through Adam's leadership, including media interviews like this, he has paved the way nationally and provincially, leading the charge for reconciliation in Canada. Adam, welcome to Real Talk, and it's wonderful to see your face again. Good morning, Brian, and it's good to see you as well. It's been a long time, and uh, I'm glad to see that you've resurfaced and you're still doing the important work that you do. Thank you. You know it, Adam, and and, and, and yeah. we're going to be talking in short order about the five-year mark uh, since the Truth and, Truth and Reconciliation Commission released that report. We're looking for, for your straight talk, your real talk assessment of what Canada has or hasn't done in the context of 
of reconciliation. Let's welcome Rahma Mohammed, a local award-winning author uh, who is passionate about diversity in children's literature and the power of telling your story. She writes stories that feature black Muslim characters to promote representation of these two intersectional identities. Rahma, welcome to the program and thank you for making time for us today. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. And uh, I would like to say that you pronounce my first name as close as anyone can. So thank you for that effort. And uh, I am, uh, I'm, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here among you guys. Well, why don't I ask you to pronounce it and let me see if I can do even better. Okay. So my name is, it means mercy in Arabic and it's pronounced Rahma. And the H is just, you know, uh, in the Arabic language, is it's a, a much pronounced uh, letter that is just not in the English language. Um, but any anybody that uh, attempts it, uh, most of the time I will get Rama, where the H is not visible. But you said it really good. So you know I appreciate that. Can I just say as an aside, I, I absolutely love when, when people know the root or the history of their name. Like, for example, when you say there, it means, it means mercy in Arabic. Is, is that something that your parents made you aware of as, as soon as you were able to understand language? I mean, as a child, were you made aware of the meaning of your name? Yeah, it's something that um, my mother, when she named me, she said uh, many people came to her and said, um, you should name her Rahma. And it just kept coming up. And she said that, you know, it just was meant to be. And of course, growing up, you have to try to live up to the name. Um, one of the in our in our religion, it's a parent's responsibility to give a, a, a great name or a, a really good name is one of uh, the duties of a parent. And um, therefore, you know, it's it's uh, it was always something that I I strive to uh, you know live up to, of course. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I uh, I found out when I was young that that my name means little king. <laughs> in, in some in some interpretation, but I th- but I think that my parents probably tried to keep me from being too aware of that because it would have led to a complex. Um, uh, Rafa, I'm going to do my best to to uh, to to improve my pronunciation of your name. I do want to begin with you, and I want to right now just officially on the record encourage all three of our panelists this morning to jump in to interact with one another. This roundtable is designed to be candid and casual, and you don't have to wait for me to address you. Uh, but Rafa. I want to begin with you because obviously I think people across Canada and most especially people in Edmonton are paying close attention to two uh, and, and not only two. There are obviously more throughout history, tragically, but two recent attacks targeting uh, black hijabi women in Edmonton, violent attacks. Police have made arrests. Police have identified individuals facing charges. These are not rumors. These are events that did happen, though I'm supposed to say allegedly, but witness account indicates that these are very troubling circumstances that I know have been sending um, ripples through Edmonton's Muslim community. Uh, Yourself, as a hijabi woman in Edmonton, how are you perceiving what you're seeing happening and how are you processing it? Um, well, first of all, it's it's. Uh, I understand that uh, perhaps you have to say alleged, but uh, when on the first crime he was uh, charged with a hate crime. So it uh, these are real events that are happening in our city. Um, of course, as a Black Muslim woman in living in this city, it was a devastating for me to hear on what happened. Um, it also kind of really just triggered a lot of the fears that I. Uh, have to live with on a daily basis and it just kind of made me realize that I have a lot of habits and things that I do um, that stem from the fear of being attacked but also now living uh, through a pandemic and now you have an added fear of being attacked and then now there are increasing concerns of if I do get it attacked in in public um, will I have people to assist me because everyone is now also fearing being, um, you know, getting sick for, from the pandemic. Um, also, this brought up the fact that, you know, aside from our homes, our cars are supposed to be another sanctuary. And the fact that the first attack happened in broad daylight 
um, in a uh, crowded area where someone was sitting in their car and they got attacked um, in their car where their windshield was broken and then they got, uh, you know, dragged outside and, and attacked physically there. It brings out a lot of fears for me, for my sisters, uh, for members of my community, from any Muslim visible woman um, that wears the veil. It just brings on a lot of extra fear and stress on top of all the trauma and the stress that we're living through because of this pandemic. Dr. Sharif, we've, we've, we've heard uh, that bystanders uh, did, uh, to a certain degree, I didn't witness it, I didn't see it, I've not seen video of, of these uh, events, but, but apparently there was some bystander involvement. Of course, an incident or incidents like these uh, reiterate, I think, the importance of, of support um, for identifiable communities across the spectrum, whether we're talking about uh, hijabi women or, 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 or the Muslim community, whether we're talking about the Jewish community, whether we're talking about uh, gay and lesbian community, whatever the case is, uh, uh, there are uh, certainly conversations to be had about what we as a greater society can do here. Uh, what are your thoughts, your general thoughts, or as specific as you'd like to get on what we're seeing here, these troubling incidents, these hate-fueled incidents in Edmonton, certainly not isolated to Edmonton, but most recently right here in Alberta's capital city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think it's no surprise to know that Alberta is one of the kind of uh, top sites for homegrown um, white supremacy. Um, Alberta specifically, our, our numbers, um, the, the amount of uh, white supremacist hate generating individuals that we pump out is higher and disproportionately higher than most Cases, no, most areas of the province. Um, that is, you know, something to be looked at and is an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. Um, I think there is a huge um, misunderstanding around uh, what an ally is and what I try and educate my students about it. And, and quite uh, frankly, most recently, I've been working interdisciplinarily um, across um, different areas of. Um, uh, healthcare, I've worked with law enforcement, I'm working with education students, um, corporations to educate people on what it means to be an ally and what virtue signaling means. So a lot of people think that their intentions are good, they share things on Facebook, they share things on Twitter, they share things on social media, they recirculate stories, but it kind of ends there. And, and the problem with just sharing information that way is that you're not really acting, right? We've, we've arrived at this moment in history where it's, it's not enough to be neutral. It's not enough to just sit back and watch. It's not enough to just think that you're a good person. You need to act on those intentions. You need to act on that um, consciousness. Islamophobia has been around for a very long time. And Islamophobia towards the Black community specifically is um, disproportionately more violent. And I think um, it's fantastic that these bystanders jumped in and actually risked their own uh, comfort, risked their own safety, risked risk their own privilege to go beyond just uh, saying, oh, that's so horrible, or do you know what happened? And so going beyond virtue signaling means quite frankly, becoming a co-conspirator. And that comes from the work of Dr. Bettina Love, who talks about white folks need to really uh, um, use their unearned privileges, their state risk, safety, and or perhaps comfort to go uh, above and beyond um, just speaking out about things. And that means, you know, stopping something in its tracks, um, yelling for help, um, you know, not necessarily um, always intervening in a crime, but, um, you know, it could go as, as um, it could be as small as um, stopping a racist comment in its tracks. Uh, and to be honest, a lot of people uh, misunderstand what racism looks like. There is no doubt that this was a hate crime. There is no doubt that this was racially motivated. Um, but a, a lot of these uh, smaller acts or more uh, covert acts of racism come in the form of <clears throat> comments or microaggressions, um, omissions. Um, and when we don't seek to look at the problem, the, the roots of the problem, we, we dismiss them as just being, uh, you know, this is just the way things are. So I think people really need to understand what racism today looks like. And yes, very much so, these uh, hate 
crimes are racially motivated, but racism could look as uh, insignificant as an omission or even a comment. Adam, I would suspect as an indigenous Canadian, a lot of what you're hearing here is probably resonating with you. Uh, yes, it is, Ryan. Um, you know, um, uh, we, we're very empathetic to uh, what had happened a few days ago at uh, at the mall with, uh, you know, a visible minority in Canada. And uh, the Indigenous people in, in Canada, uh, you know, were faced with uh, systemic racism on a daily basis. And, um, you know, and it's something that, uh, you know, we've had to live with because we've suffered years and years and years of oppression. And I think the, uh, you know, the number one reason why we face systemic racism is, uh, you know, lack of understanding from mainstream Canadians on the atrocities and the history of the, indi the true history of the Indigenous people. And I think, uh, you know, once, uh, you know, mainstream Canadians can really grasp on the, uh, you know, the true history of what had happened to us, you know, uh, I think that that's a barrier, you know, in breaking down through that uh, systemic racism. And, uh, you know, it's it's an ongoing story. And, and I, and I'm a firm believer that education is, uh, is an important tool in uh, breaking those barriers of, uh, you know, racism that we face in Canada. You know, all three of our panelists, all three of you um, do your own work in education. That's 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 part of the reason why I was thrilled at all. Let me just say you were the three first choices that we had for this panel. We feel like you tick all the boxes. We're talking about citizen education. We're talking about educating teachers before they head into schools. We're talking about educating young people and instilling pride in young people. I mean, we're, we're really, I think, going to have a wonderful conversation. And before we get to the education, process. And before we get to what we can do as a society, let's continue to try to identify the issues, the problems where they exist. Uh, Rachma, I want to ask you about what Dr. Sharif just mentioned, the microaggressions, the omissions. Uh, Dr. Mana Saleh joined us uh, a couple of days ago on the show, an incredibly powerful interview. She touched on the same things. She talked about omissions. She talked about microaggressions herself as an academic, uh, as a PhD, as an educator. What does that mean? mean when we're talking about virtue signaling when we're talking about microaggressions what is your lived experience what do people need to understand so i'm glad you asked me that i did a whole ted talk uh, last year actually about the acts of microaggressions and how it is to live as a black muslim woman so um, acts of microaggressions as a black person acts of microaggression as a muslim person um, in different spaces, whether I'm occupying a workspace, whether I am in public or in any places. I think it's easy for us to call out um, hate crimes and um, challenge uh, racist remarks. But what about those subtle things that happen to us on a daily basis? What about the things that chip away, at, like I say, at our identity? Um, the things that are harder for us to challenge, the things that are harder for us to identify, the things that we can't give words to, a look that I receive that I know is conveying doubt in what I'm saying. It could be me uh, raising a question in a meeting and um, people asking, well, what do you mean? Can you reframe that? And then that is sending a message to me that you're questioning either my intelligence you're questioning maybe uh, my knowledge. Um, you're putting me down without really anyone else being able to pick up on it. But I know what you're doing. I feel it. And it's hard for me to explain that to people when they have never walked a day in my shoe as a Black Muslim woman. Um, they don't understand that I understand between the lines, that I am reading between what you're saying. Um, it's me being asked about my hijab every time. It's me being uh, randomly selected at the airport every single time. It's my name being checked against an invisible list that I don't know where what it has to do with me. Um, it's every single day, these little acts that uh, let me know that I fully do not belong here, whether it's our credentials, whether it's our positions, whether it's whatever we have achieved, 
it's chipping away at anything that we are achieving and letting us know that we, with these comments, we're putting you in your place. We are going to still kind of question you. You have to, it's almost like my parents have always told me you have to do double the work to get half of what they have. And, and that's exactly it. You have to fight every single, at every single level that you get to, you have to fight twice as hard to continuously prove yourself. And I think what Dr. Salah was saying is that even though she is a doctor and she, um, you know, worked hard for that title is that she still gets questioned. And when someone is asking for her, they're not sure that, um, I'm sure they're not picturing her. And that's what she said. She, she gets a look of saying, oh, that's you. That's always the thing. It's me being asked, oh, you speak very well. You speak very well for somebody that immigrated to Canada. Well, I speak both official languages perfectly fine. And I can understand you in any of that. And I have a third language. It's people um, just always making these assumptions. And it's hard for us to call those things out because it's so minute um, that it's hard for me to explain. And most of the time, we just shrug it off because we don't know how to give voice to that. I I mean, you say it's hard for you to explain. I think you just did a remarkable job of, of allowing us to, to do as best as we can to walk a mile in your shoes. Um, you know, I referenced a neurosurgeon that I saw in the Surgeon's Cut. It's this new Netflix show uh, the other day. He's, he's uh, at, at one of the foremost, uh, most celebrated hospitals uh, in the United States, a, a neurosurgeon. And he, and he talked about how one of his professors when he was in med school said, uh, there's no way you're from Mexico. You're way too smart to be from Mexico. And it was something that 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 still to this day when he talked about it, I mean, he, he's he's at the Mayo Clinic and he's one of the most celebrated neurosurgeons in the entire world. And you can tell it still eats at him and it still motivates him. Uh, Dr. Sharif, I saw you physically clapping there. And so I want to just hand the microphone over to you. Oh, I don't even know where to start. Um, I think as uh, Rama was talking about um, all of these instances of microaggressions, I think there's so many um, dark folks out there who are probably nodding their head and clapping their hands like myself. I think the problem with um, how racism has kind of entered into our social consciousness, we don't necessarily associate racism with everyday things like um, Rama was explaining. I think what we currently understand racism to be is these hate crimes. And yet, while those are very, very uh, violent forms of racism, socialization has taught us that racism can fit, can, consists of individual acts of meanness that are committed by just a few really bad people. And the people who commit these acts are considered to be racist. And none of us can be racist. Uh, even dark folks, you know, there are dark folks who I talk to all the time who are like, well, look at me, I can't be racist. But what happens is these ideas construct racism as being a binary. So if you're you're bad if you're racist and you're good if you're not racist. And, and what this binary teaches us is that there are two mutually uh, exclusive and distinct categories of, um, of you're not a racist or you're racist. And, and actually the work of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi teaches us that you're either actively being an anti-racist or you're racist. And every single person that walks this earth has the capacity to be racist, period, full stop. Um, and that, you know, these binaries create the false understanding that racism is for bad people. Uh, and it only exists um, across racial lines and it's only a problem for dark folks. Uh, but these binaries create super false divisions. They reinforce the idea that racism is only relegated to these specific elevated um, incidents. When, when Rama just explained like about a hundred different specific acts of racism um, and these binaries that we create, like a bad person is racist and a good person is not racist, um, create the illusion of neutrality and quite frankly, racism is a problem for everyone. And so if you are only thinking about racism in terms of being not racist and being racist, um, and if you are on the non-racist side, that will automatically relegate you to the category of neutral, which means no further action is needed on your part, um, and therefore you're not a racist. So racism isn't your problem and it doesn't concern you and there's nothing further that you need to do. 
But this guarantees your position um, as a member of the dominant group, most specifically white folks, that you don't have to build your critical thinking skills, or nor do you have to think critically about how race implicates you. Um, and then when you are implicated in conversation about racism, you get defensive, um, you further create this binary because you take it as a personal insult, like, oh, this person called me racist, or, oh, this person thinks I'm a racist. When in fact, if we start thinking about racism as every single person has the capacity to be anti-racist or racist, and when you say, I'm not a racist, that like automatically relegates to, to this like neutral form of racism. So saying, I'm not a racist, uh, is actually you're in denial because every single person on the face of this earth has the capacity to be racist. And when you can understand that, it's not a personal attack, mm -hmm. right? Dr. Kennedy talks about it being like a name tag that you can peel off and stick on. It's just an adjective. It's not this all encompassing identity making category that you just get put into as being a racist. And, and if you admit it, that there are moments in your life when you are being racist, it's not a forever category. You can be aware of that category and actively work towards becoming anti-racist. And these ideologies, there's two ideologies specifically that I just wanna talk about. The, ide the ideology of individualism and the ideology of meritocracy that hold these binaries in place. And the ideology of individualism essentially is the story or this narrative that creates and communicates and reproduces and reinforces the concept that each of us is a unique individual and our group membership like race and class and gender are not important when in fact we know that your race and your class and your gender are very important. Look at your pan panelists today. You have um, panelists with lived experiences and we never get afforded individuality. We are always relegated to our group, um, our group memberships. And so when you have this idea that you can exist as an individual, that's actually a very um, a loaded concept um, and it really only applies uh, to white folks. Um, the other um, manifestation of this kind of racist ideology is this notion of meritocracy where everyone can succeed on their own effort or merit. And I loved what Rama said earlier about her parents teaching her the value of her education and her self-worth because my parents being um, immigrants to Canada in the early 60s taught me because you're a woman and because you're brown and because you're Muslim, you're gonna have to work harder, you're gonna have to be stronger, you're gonna be, have to be faster, you're gonna have to be everything more than the average person just to even get to the, to the starting line. And so for me, my parents taught me that education is your currency in this life. And if you don't have education, you're gonna be nothing. And quite frankly, even accessing education, uh, and Adam comes and talks to my classes all the time about the legacies of colonialism and the legacies of uh, the residential schools and the 60s scoop and the Indian Act, even accessing education is privilege. And a lot of um, white folks don't, don't realize that education is a privilege. And so this intersectionality of race and class and gender um, really levels out this notion of individualism and meritocracy. And so all of these microaggressions are ingrained in society in a way where we can't see them. They're invisible unless you start looking for them. That's the remarkable Dr. Farah Sharif, uh, an educator at the University of Alberta, Adam North Pagan. Uh, I'm going to give you the mic in just a second because I want to transition this conversation. When you talk about, uh, you know, Dr. Sharif's parental influence here, Adam uh, himself, a survivor of the 60s scoop, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Want to take a quick break to thank our sponsors that ensure that each and every day we're able to bring you this show from the Real Talk studio with the lights and the cameras and the action. And that includes the team at the Dairy Queens of Northwest. West Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Uh, these two owners, Michael and Mark, have the six locations that we tell you about every day. Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. Now, why is that especially important right now? It's especially important right now because they're Christmas frozen ice cream logs. You want your kids to love you forever. Hell, you want your spouse, partner to love you 
forever. You want to drop something off in, you know, minus 20 outside on your neighbor's front porch. That's that. I mean, now's the time to do it. You can leave it out there. It's going to stay frozen for the 10 minutes. You send them the text. I had not tell them thought to go pick it about up. dropping ice cream on people's porches. Why that's not? such a great idea. What a great idea. Yeah. See, let's, this let's is, use this the is Sam. To our advantage. This is Sam letting me know what he would like for Christmas for his his <laughs> the, the, the Real Talk staff Christmas party is not going to be as robust as we would like this year. But perhaps, Sam, you will find a Christmas frozen ice cream log on your front doorstep and you will know that I only paid 50 percent for it because I cited because I said I watch or I listen to Real Talk when you go to one of those six locations. Our thanks to DQ for that. Westworld Computers is also making today possible with the MacBook Pro, the uh, iPhone, the iMac on Max's desk, uh, Max, uh, Sam's desk, Max. Why did I call you Max? I, I don't know. It's like, that's like a first date mistake. <laughs> Our first date was like two months ago. On Brooksy's desk. And of course, the iPad in front of me as well. Westworld Computers has been in the family business uh, for more than 40 years serving Western Canada, and they do an amazing job. So if you're looking to support those who are supporting Real Talk, take your business, uh, computers, phones, everything else you need tech to Westworld Computers and Clean Air Club. I love this. We keep telling you about their furnace filter deal and and how you sign up and you tell them the size of the filter and then they take care of all the rest. Well, I want to go to my phone because... I love you guys. When you start letting us know what your experiences have been like, that's what matters most. These are customer testimonials. These are real people. I'm going to say their first and last name. So you know I'm not just blowing hot air. You see what I did there? Julie Rohr. She was on the show in the first week. You remember her? One of the most remarkable people on planet Earth? She tweets yesterday, I'd like to thank Jespo and Real Talk. We joined the Clean Air Club yesterday, and our furnace filters were sitting outside our door this morning. What? And then Don Seller responds to her. Don says, mine arrived the next day, too. I was floored, and the bonus local gift was such a nice touch. So there you have it. Don't listen to me today. Listen to Julie and Don, who are happy customers at cleanairclub.ca. All right, let's get back to our panelists. I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you because you're telling us on our YouTube comments, you're telling us on the hashtag how much you're appreciating this conversation with Dr. Farha Sharif, who's joining us, uh, author Rahma Mohammed, and Adam North Pagan, president of the 60s Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta. Adam, there's a lot to catch up on, and you've been waiting very patiently to have the microphone, but I want to sort of focus our conversation a little bit more toward uh, your area of, may I call it, uh, without sounding insensitive, unfortunate expertise. You yourself were taken from your family unit as a young man, as part of the 60s scoop. Now, Canadians, I think, have been discussing, in some circumstances, uh, casually, truth and reconciliation. And we've just marked the five-year anniversary of the release of the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In that context, how is this morning's conversation resonating with you? Uh, you know what, uh, Ryan, I, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased and honored to be a part of this discussion today because things like this continue, need to happen and they uh, continue to need, they continue to have to happen, you know, uh, uh, you know, to give mainstream Canadians a, a broad awareness of, uh, you know, the atrocities and that, you know, that we've had to face. And much like, uh, you know, uh, the visible minorities in Canada, you know, the Indigenous people, you know, uh, we talk about that oppression, you know, with the, uh, you know, the signing of treaties, colonization, the residential school, the 60s scoop, the missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada, you know, the forced sterilization of our women in the uh, Indian hospitals. And, you know, that's, that's all contributed to, uh, you know, to, the, uh, you know, how, how we've had to, uh, you know, to live today. And, Three days ago, um, you know, marked the five-year anniversary of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that commission was uh, was brought about as a result of the uh, the residential schools in Canada. And uh, having said that, Alberta uh, was leading the way across Canada with the most residential schools in Canada. Alberta had the most. And <clears throat> that the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission was brought about as an opportunity to uh, improve the lives of the Indigenous people in Canada. And uh, five, uh, five, three days ago, the uh, former commissioners of that TRC, uh, Senator Murray Sinclair, uh, Chief Wilkin Littlechild, as well as um, 
Marie Wilson, they were brought together and uh, they had the opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, uh, what strides that uh, the government has made in addressing and, and putting forward and implementing the 94 calls to action. And the uh, common message coming from the uh, the former commissioners is that uh, it's been a very, very, very slow process. And it's really, really unfortunate, you know, that that has happened. But if you talk to uh, a government of Canada official like the uh, Federal Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, uh, the Honourable Carolyn Bennett, she begs to differ. She is of the opinion that the government of Canada has done a lot of work, you know, to implement the uh, the uh, not the calls to action on the uh, 90, uh, on the um, reconciliation. But, uh, you know, uh, we, the Indigenous people, feel that there is much, much more work that needs to be done. And failure to really, you know, take into account of, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing the, these 94 calls to action to improve the lives of Indigenous people affects racism towards our people. Because within those 94 recommendations, there is a, a strong component on education. And when that education is not happening, you know, it really, really affects affects, uh, you know, uh, unhealthy attitudes that feel racism towards our towards our people. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm of the opinion, uh, Ryan, that there is still a lot more work that needs to be done. And uh, we're, uh, you know, we're feeling quite um, sorry that, uh, you know, within the five years that there hasn't been, you know, uh, more uh, commitment and dedication on behalf of the government of Canada to implement, uh, you know, those those calls to action, as well as the UNDRIP, the United Nations Indigenous Rights of the Indigenous People. You know, that's another classic example, you know. So failure to really go forward and, and work with these uh, legislations is, is it really contributes to, to the racism that we face in, in Canada. Adam, I, I um, you know, I've, uh, I keep referencing, I don't want to obsess over my previous employment, uh, but sometimes I've had I've had experiences that I think are relevant to these conversations. And Adam, you and I have spoken many times uh, over the years, and 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 you you've sat with me in studio, and I've I've I have physically turned my computer monitor away from you in past because of the horrific comments that I would receive on this text line from people as soon as you and I would talk about things like the 60s scoop or as soon as we would talk about colonization or as soon as we would talk about truth and reconciliation, the commission's work. Um, and, and, it, and it indicated to me, and, it, and, and it, quite frankly, it discouraged me and it was appalling every single time to see some of the, com not all of the comments, but some of the comments that, that would indicate to someone who approaches this from a, a pessimistic perspective that this is something that this is a wound that will not heal in Canada. And I know that indigenous Canadians talk about the need for seven generations of healing. And that number is very significant. Adam, do you like, be honest, real talk. Do you believe that indigenous people's relationship with Canada and Canadian, uh, a non-indigenous Canadians relationship with indigenous Canadians uh, not on an individual level, but as as groups that coexist collectively, can this relationship be healed? Uh, you know what? Uh, I believe that uh, it can, uh, Ryan, but it's going to take a lot of work. And you know what? Uh, the oppression and, and the things that have happened, you know, happened over years and years, over 100 years, you know, ever since uh, colonization. And, you know, so it's it's not going to happen overnight. Um, you know, it's it's going to take, uh, uh, you know, quite a while. And when you, when you, uh, something that really kind of rang out with me when you were mentioning the previous times that I've been on your show and you've received those comments, comments, you know, and, you know, the, and it's comments like that that really uh, feel that racism. But if this is real talk and if this is no holds barred, to me, it's pure ignorance. That That's, you know, call it for what it is. It's pure ignorance. And, uh, you know, so Canadians need to really wake up and, uh, and you know, and, and look at really what had happened, you know, the true history of Canada. And that, you know, and if we're calling a spade a spade, you know, we look at the current government in the province of Alberta, you know, they have done some interesting things that, uh, you know, that really jeopardizes that relationship with the Indigenous people in the province of Alberta, you know, like uh, the appointment of, uh, you know, when Premier Jason Kenney tried to appoint Paul Bonner as his speechwriter, 
knowing that he had a history of racist comments towards the indigenous people. Now, what is he doing, you know, appointing someone, uh, you know, as a speechwriter in the education curriculum, you know, with K, uh, K, K to four, you know, uh, once again, Premier Jason Kenney and the Minister of Education, the Honourable Adrian Lagrange, appointed, uh, you know, somebody to that panel who had very, very, very racist, uh, you know, uh, history of racism towards the indigenous people. So, Ask, you know, what is somebody like that doing sitting on a panel, you know, that's there to develop curriculum that, uh, you know, that goes into the schools and in in all the schools in Alberta, you know, when, uh, you know, when, when there's someone there that's, you know, that has those kind of attitudes, you know, so uh, it was a very appalling and, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to very proud to say that I went on the front steps of the Alberta legislature calling for their heads because, you know, something needs to happen, you know, so, uh, you know, so I think it really has to start with the government as well. You know, um, we've had a paternalistic relationship with the government in Canada, the government of Alberta, and that needs to change. That has to change. Rahma, we, we, we talk, I mean, we, we, you want to take a look at the 94 recommendations uh, that, that came from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it has prompted some conversation uh, in Canada, and I hope in Alberta, about curriculum and about what we're teaching kids. And we're certainly seeing in Indigenous communities and outside Indigenous communities, the public calling for, for better education and, and a more robust curriculum around Canada's Indigenous history, Canada's First Peoples, the history of Canada before 1867, etc. Now, a huge part of your work as a children's author has been to have uh, black Muslim children see themselves represented in literature. Can you take us into your perspective on representation and education, background, cultural awareness, and identity? Um, absolutely. So as a black Muslim, uh, you know, woman, um, I identify into many different, um, you know, minorities. It's like a minority within a minority. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very important for me to see positive representation because positive uh, representation is not just seeing yourself, but it's being uh, seen in a positive light. And it's also uh, seeing and hearing stories coming from your own community, sharing stories that are intended for your community. So for me, when I immigrated to Canada, I was eight years old. Um, I didn't own, I only learned to read when I was 10. So I kind of skipped that, uh, you know, children's book uh, age group. Um, and when I started to read um, and I learned, uh, actually English is my third language, but I, learned French uh, when I came to Canada. We immigrated in Quebec. And I remember looking for stories with Black girls. Um, I couldn't find any. And any of the stories that I found were written by white authors. And they had a lot of, uh, you know, misrepresentation of either my African identity or just being Black, coming from socioeconomic backgrounds with a lot of uh, racist um, you know, uh, stereotypes and things like that. When I became a mother, it was really important for me to find literature that bolsters my children's identity as Black children and also as Muslim children. And it was very difficult for me to find books that had these two components because I believe that our identity as Blacks and as Muslims are both very important in how we show up into the world. They are both, uh, you know, identities that are seen in negative lights at times. Um, and it was very important for me to bolster those two identities in my children. And I was unable to find these type of uh, books I had in my bookshelves. I had Muslim children's books and Black uh, African-American children uh, literature, but very seldom well done children's books that have both of these criteria were very difficult for me. So I uh, then pursued uh, the route of writing these children's books because I found that uh, positive representation has a very big impact on how children see themselves, um, how these stories kind of bolster um, and boost their self-esteem and how they feel seen and heard um, in these stories. Uh, I want to 
have my children see themselves as, you know, doctors. I, I want them to be see themselves as um, being the superhero, being the main character, not just the friend at school that is the new immigrant. Why are we having stories about just being uh, the object of curiosity? Why couldn't we have stories where the children are just being themselves? Because we have lives of just being who we are. You know, my my children um, want to see stories of just being normalized. I, they want to see stories of just children living their lives. And that's why I write uh, for this category of children and just uh, showcasing that. I think that the first step in, uh, you know, combating uh, racism is with education and it can start as soon as the children are small and it is normalizing our lives, normalizing. And it's, it has nothing to do with talking about race or anything. I want people to know that we are people that experience things just like anyone else. Our families are going through the same things as other families are going through. And through these books, I want uh, children that are black Muslims to see themselves represented to know that someone sees them as the superhero that they are um, in their lives. Dr. Sherry, when we asked you to, to uh, provide us with a bio so we could properly introduce you for this show, I absolutely loved and, and we'll note that one of your beautiful daughters is celebrating her birthday today and, and they're all around you and they're reading Mama's shirt just like everybody else on Wednesday. We smashed the patriarchy and and, and you said facetiously, of course, in your bio, uh, Mama to three bossy young women and, and boy, could we ever dive into to, to how girls are described as bossy while men are described as assertive, right? I mean, we could probably get into that if we really wanted to, but let me ask you this. You said three bossy young women who will run the world one day. Now, you told us about how your parents, immigrants to Canada, talked to you about being a young, brown, Muslim girl and how you were going to have to work harder to see equal returns on the investment of your work. I suspect that maybe you've not had the same conversation with your daughters, or am I wrong? No, you're totally right, uh, Ryan, and... um, (laughs) I have to say, uh, to be my partner and to be my children is is no easy feat because you know I, I have high expectations of everyone in my family, and I just want to speak to what Rahma was saying about representation in literature and and tie it back to your question. Um, so much of my doctoral research, Rahma, was about. Um, problematizing the canon uh, that exists in education with regards to what is regarded as knowledge. And I know Dr. Manis, Manas Saleh um, mentioned that as well, what uh, on the, the other day when I was watching what constitutes knowledge, whose knowledge is worth knowing and why. And so much of what you were saying, you know, I was nodding my head because uh, it's so important to see us beyond being the model minority, right? I want my kids to have the experience of, of being um, and just being really and not having their identity um, questioned. Uh, my doctoral research started with the question, um, how Canadian are you? And what, what does it mean to be Canadian? And I interviewed and worked with um, high school students about their experiences growing up. And um, if you've listened to me on other podcasts or other interviews, I grew up in St. Albert and there was no one that looked like me growing up. And I think for me as a mother, uh, it was really important for my for for my children to feel like they belonged at school, to feel like they uh, were just a regular kid, and 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 to just kind of uh, you know not necessarily stand out all the time. Um, and you use the word bossy, and that that one's a, a, a prickly one for me because I remember um, my oldest daughter Maya. Um, she's 18 now, and she grew up with a very assertive personality. She still is very assertive. She's very well-spoken. Um, so is Sophia. So is Elisa. And um, my children are very sure of themselves because they have language. They have lived experience. They have cultural in- insider perspective and knowledge on what it feels to be a visible minority. And and um, <clears throat> a common uh, you know label that was applied to all three of them actually, uh, was that they were bossy. And so for, for, um, for Christmas uh, gifts one year, uh, we gave one of the teachers um, 
a book about women uh, feminism, and I believe it was Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. And uh, it talks about the notion of being bossy as being a misnomer and how it should be reclaimed as actually a positive adjective towards, uh, towards women. Um, and so <laughs> I like the word bossy because I like to reclaim it and flip it um, as being a very powerful, uh, empowering word uh, towards women. Um, and uh, even, you know, your conversation the other day with Dr. Saleh about, um, you know, women and their credentials. You know, we're, we're silenced, we're minimized, we are, we are omitted from so many conversations, whether it's academic, whether it's, um, you know, cultural, whether it's intellectual, all of them. And so I think for me, as a, as a mom, I want to raise my daughters to be confident in who they are as individuals, uh, not specifically um, the labels that get applied to them. Adam, when it when it comes to to applying this concept uh, to to how uh, young Indigenous students are uh, see themselves represented in curriculum, to uh, perhaps infusing or including or celebrating uh, cultural traditions as as part of young education or education through into post secondary. I mean, you know, all three of you, if you're if you're not watching it now, uh, you can go back uh, and watch this broadcast, and you can see the comments uh, of people that are tuned in right now in real time. Time. And Adam, as we've been talking about the TRC reports and as we've been talking about the history of, uh, of residential schools, and I, and I use the word legacy and not in a flattering way, obviously, many people are testifying that they do not remember any education around residential schools, very limited curriculum around Canada's first peoples and Indigenous Canadians. Uh, what needs to change? In other words, specifically, what would you like to see? with regards to young people, uh, Indigenous Canadians, seeing themselves represented and understanding, having a more robust understanding of their culture and having Canadian students across the board better understand Canada's first people. You know what, uh, Ryan? Um, I think over the past couple of years, I had the opportunity to uh, take the uh, national exhibit, Canada's national exhibit, uh, on a tour in the province of Alberta. And uh, we went to about uh, 11, 12 different sites uh, for all the way from high level down to uh, Lethbridge, Alberta and everything in between. And we traveled with the uh, national exhibit on the legacy and the atrocities of 60 Scoop in Canada as an opportunity to educate mainstream Albertans on the uh, on the legacy of 60 Scoop and and the impact and how it's impacted the indigenous people of uh, of Canada, and. You know, it's a very, very powerful and emotional exhibit. Uh, we had, we actually had it set up at uh, uh, Edmonton City Hall, uh, a few other places in, in the city of Edmonton as well. But one common theme that has come through that uh, that was uh, really prevalent with the uh, mainstream uh, Albertans that went through and saw the exhibit was they came they came out of it, and one thing that they told us was, "I'm sorry." You know, I didn't know that that had happened in in Canada. You know, and and as and and this is a, a grassroots mainstream Albertan that has come through and has said that. You know, and uh, and you know, and we we also heard a lot of people telling us that. You know what? When I was a kid going to school, that was never taught in in the education. That was never taught in the classrooms. You know, so that kind of contributes to that lack of education that uh, that happened historically. You know, with uh, you know, with uh, with curriculum, it was never talked about. It, it was a it was a dark secret uh, in Canada's history, and it was never never really talked about. You know, so we have those young children that are that have grown up and become uh, you know adults. You know, around my age today, that don't have that understanding. You know, so for the Indigenous people, you know, uh, I. I guess what we would like to see is that a lot of our people, you know, uh, uh, are, are in positions of leadership, are in positions of being able to uh, influence when policy is uh, is developed, you know, uh, you know, within the federal government, within the uh, Alberta government, the provincial governments, you know, because we need to have significant influence in in policy development. And uh, you know, with uh, 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta, we've been very, very good about uh, being able to uh, influence child welfare reform because there's still a high number of Indigenous children that are in the care of uh, child welfare. And you know what? 
the government needs to do things differently and we need to be able to influence you know and and have some uh, some you know some influence in uh, you know overhauling you know policy when policy is developed and so I, I just want to get to a couple of comments here before we wrap here. And I, and I want to give each of our panelists an opportunity. It's so liberating to not be bound by the clock, but we've asked them for an hour of their time, uh, but we can, we can spill over into 10 o'clock. It's been I, an hour I, already. Yeah, I know. No yeah. kidding. Hey, Sam, I, I, I want, uh, we're going to ask for a call to action. I feel like this whole hour has been a call to action, but a specific and pointed call to action from each of our panelists. But you know, Chad is watching right now. He says, you know, I grew up in, in central rural Alberta in the two thousands, uh, Chad, a young fella says, I didn't get, I didn't receive any education on residential schools. Sweet tea says, what a good point reiterated by Dr. Sharif that the choices about curriculum are so impactful. Um, uh, Judy says indigenous newborn babies still being taken away from their mothers, uh, in Alberta by social services. You know, we need to talk about that. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you know, two beaver says equity cannot happen as long as, as Qu- corporation Canada claims, you know, nearly hundred percent of land, the land of, of first nations with the original people's. Uh, at a negligible amount. Uh, Mana is watching. Dr. Salas says, yeah, the government needs to do things differently. Isn't that the case? Um, I, you know, this, this ultimately comes down to, I think, political pressure. Uh, it comes down to societal pressure. It comes down to, to individual conviction. And it comes down to resolution at an individual and at a collective level. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sharif, why don't we start with you? I want to give each of you an opportunity to, to look straight into your camera, in other words, to look right into our eyes and give us something to walk with uh, for the rest of the day and for our lives moving forward. What is your call to action for us this morning on Real Talk? Um, I would challenge you, to your viewers, your listeners, to think about how they can be actively anti-racist in their everyday lives. I want to just um, circle back to something Adam said. And Adam is a guest in my um, in my lectures every semester for the past, Adam, would you say about five years now? Yeah. And a highlight of the semester is when Adam comes to talk about the legacies of the 60s scoop. And, and these are these are beginning teachers. These teachers are going to be working as full-fledged frontline teachers um, in, in schools all over Alberta, all over Canada. And what I teach my students, what I'd like to teach your viewers and your listeners, is that the capacity to be anti-racist is really not necessarily looking at individual acts, but specifically focusing on the inequitable distribution of power and racial power in particular at all aspects of society, whether it's education. And let me tell you, we could, Ryan, we can have a whole other conversation on the, the what's happening in Alberta with curriculum um, and how it's deeply rooted in um, racism and you know, I'll just leave that nugget for you for another time. Well, no, but hang on a second. No, because no, cause in, in, unless unless anybody has to leave, uh, let's dig into it. I don't have to go any. If if, if anyone has to, ex- <laughs> if anyone let's has to, there. if anyone has to excuse themselves, that's totally fine. But I would rather you. I, I don't want to leave it. Let, I let's like, go there. Is I would kind like of our to. Motto. I would like to get into it. Okay, uh, you, uh, that's my style. So essentially, like you know, how we look at. Um, going beyond celebrating like food festivals fanfare like why are these stories left out of our curriculum why are we trying to silence the inclusion of residential schools um, and content about you know how the Canadian government the federal government was complicit in the production and reproduction and the maintenance and the legacies of residential schools and the trauma and the ensuing um, you know, intergenerational uh, impact that continue to impact, um, you know, Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Like, the, we need to look at the structures that are in place. We need to analyze the social and the cultural and then the institutional power that exists that so profoundly shapes the meaning and the outcomes of how we educate our young people. Um, you know, when we become anti-racist and actively anti-racist, we need to recognize that racism is embedded in all aspects of society. What is our biggest agent of socialization that we have in the modern world? It's education. If we don't look at how and what we're educating our young people with, we've failed. 
we need to interrogate those structures that uphold these institutional forms of racism that are being socialized into our young people and how they participate in, in racist relations every single day. And if we don't interrupt these relations by educating people on how to, first of all, identify and name and challenge these norms and patterns and traditions and ideologies and structures and institutions that keep racism in place, we're, we're just spinning our wheels, so to speak. And so a key aspect of this educational process is to essentially wake people up to what modern forms of racism looks like. It's to raise our consciousness of not just everyone, but white folks specifically about what racism is and how it works. And to accomplish this, we have to challenge the dominant understanding of what racism is and expand that to think beyond individual acts of only some bad individuals that happen instead of looking at it as a system in which we are all implicated. What's happening with the Canadian government right now, what's happening with the Alberta government and the curriculum conversations, we have to ask who's sitting at the table, who's not sitting at the table, um, you know, who, who are the people that are being impacted by these, uh, you know, proposed changes? Why are we, why are we rushing to create a brand new panel of educational specialists who claim to have, uh, you know, neutrality? Here's a news flash for your viewers and your watchers. Um, knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge is socially constructed. Who you are impacts what you know and what you know impacts who you are and how we choose to respond to problems or how we explain or theorize problems um, will determine how we respond to them. So if you're sitting from a place of privilege and if you're a white male who has very little education on the trauma, traumas and the horrors and the atrocities of what happens to indigenous peoples, how do you think you're gonna respond to these problems? Or if you're a white female and you have no no basis, no education, no background, no inside personal cultural knowledge on what it means to be the victim of racism. How do you think they're going to respond to these curricular changes? Okay, I'm done. You don't have to be done, but that's absolutely incredible. Uh, Adam, I mean, with regards to your call to action for us, it seems to, I mean, geez, I just want you to take it right from there. Uh, you know what, Ryan, uh, <clears throat> One thing that comes to mind is I can probably sum it up and uh, it comes to my mind is having an open mind. I think that, uh, you know, when if uh, mainstream Canadians can have an open mind and have a willingness to really uh, take a, take uh, advantage of opportunities to be educated on the true history of Canada, you know, we're going to see some, uh, you know, some changes. And, uh, you know, for, for an example is we know that, uh, you know, any large municipality that uh, that we see uh, in uh, in in Alberta, which is Edmonton and Calgary, uh, right across Canada, you know, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Montreal, they're in the in the downtown core of those large municipalities. Our people are there, and you know what? A lot of times, you know, we, we see our people, uh, you know, that uh, you know that are suffering with addictions, that are homelessness, you know, that are suffering with homelessness, uh, poverty. And they're uh, living a transient lifestyle in those large municipalities. And I know that, uh, you know, a lot of mainstream uh, Canadians, when they see something like that, you know, right away, they, they label and racist and they, you know, they have racist thoughts, you know, towards our people that were basically drunk Indian bums. But you know what, when I see some, when I see something like that, you know, I kind of look at it that, uh, you know what, maybe that individual is a residential school survivor maybe they've been intergenerate intergenerationally impacted maybe there are 60 scoop survivor and that explains the reason that they are the way that they are because we're not all we're not bad people we are good people we are just people that are you know that have suffered an atrocity in our lifestyle and if i can look at them with uh, you know that more understanding and more empathy, you know, that's my goal. That's my challenge for mainstream Canadians, just to look at our people with more empathy and more understanding. And that all comes back to education and having that willingness to learn. Thank Adam, you. you know, we, we, uh, we, 
um, I don't think that this is an abstract thought. I want to focus it as much as possible. But but earlier in this conversation, I referenced that, you know, we see discrimination um, aimed at and perpetrated against different groups, identifiable groups uh, throughout our society and throughout history. We've seen it. And you talk about, um, you know, the, the stereotypes around uh, I, I'm not I don't want to use the words that you used, uh, but but, you, you know, you do, an individual that that, that perhaps has, has, has uh, you know, an, an issue with uh, drug use or, or alcohol or they're out on the street, they're experiencing homelessness. And you say, you know, nobody understands what that individual may or may not have gone through or or even what that individual's parents or grandparents may have gone through. You know, we expect people that were that were put into residential schools. These are human beings that were put into residential schools, had their hair cut, had their name changed. They were referred to by numbers uh, to graduate from these schools and then have the tools to properly parent their offspring. I mean, it's, 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 it's frankly, it's ignorant and idiotic is what it is for us to be, for us to have those expectations. You know, earlier this week, I moderated a panel on, on people who use drugs and on, on what businesses and corporations can do to show support and solidarity for Canadians that are, that are falling victim to the opioid crisis and for people that are dying uh, because of needles and because of fentanyl overdoses and those types of things. And, and we talk about how, how we judge people who use drugs. I mean, we talk about how we judge uh, people like Rahma, who who's talks about what it's like to be a hijabi woman. And, and people are saying, oh, your English is so good. I mean, all of these types of things that are that, that are experienced by people that are very real. These are these microaggressions. These are the judgments we make. And I'm so grateful that the three of you have been here to push many of us to a position of discomfort. Um, I can tell you personally that for me, the most liberating thing for me personally has been to look back on my own personal history, to look at the horrific jokes that I told when I was in junior high and high school, to look at the discriminatory language that I used as a young man from a position of ignorance and, and how that evolution, that understanding, that enlightenment has put me to a position of simply acknowledging privilege and making a serious commitment to put myself in an uncomfortable position to challenge my preconceived notions and to better understand people, to, 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 to utilize that, that, that cliche again, to walk a mile in other people's shoes. And the three of you have done such a wonderful job, I think, of pushing us to better educate ourselves and, and to confront some of our own shortcomings as human beings. Uh, Rahma, before I ask you for, for your call to action, I want to let you know that that uh, Fatima and, and other people that are that are that are watching and listening in right now are saying you have to tell us where we can find your books. So uh, first off, uh, by way of my Twitter account, uh, before every show, uh, I let you know our audience who's going to be on the show. So that's how you can find our guests here. And I've also just tweeted a link to to Rahma's uh, website, and so you can uh, get your hands on on the books that she has has done a remarkable job with. Okay, so here we are. We're giving you last word unless somebody else jumps in, which is totally cool as well, because it's Friday and we're chilling and we've all got coffees and everybody's good to go. What is your call to action for the audience tuned in today? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for this conversation, because I feel like I've learned a great deal today from uh, Dr. Sharif and also from Adam. Um, I think you both raised a, a lot of great points about education. As someone who grew up in Canada and was uh, educated in Canada mainly, um, a lot of the things that you have brought up uh, resonated with me because there's a lot of things that I did not learn uh, throughout my education here in Canada. Um, and recently with the pandemic and my daughter uh, being uh, distant learning since the pandemic this year, I've made the decision to actually homeschool her um, due to the, to the fact that I'm working from home. It's just more convenient for me, but it also has pushed me to kind of take a great look at what the curriculum is. Um, in Alberta, I ma mainly my education was in Ontario, but it's not much different. Um, a lot of these books that are being pushed on the children are coming from Eurocentric um, authors. Um, the, the 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 core of the education in Indigenous uh, education was very lacking. We did not learn any of these things. I'm having to kind of learn some of this history that I was never taught to me. And I don't want that to be uh, continually perpetuated on my children. So um, having the fact that I'm homeschooling now, I'm, I'm taking that decision to uh, choose 
what I'm able to teach my children, uh, what to put focus on, um, choosing what authors are being provided to her. Um, it's very important for as parents, as individuals, to really uh, embody uh, critical thinking. Um, who's telling the story? Um, what is their background? What is uh, the main thing uh, of, of, of this story? Um, it's very important to ask these questions um, so that we are able to distinguish um, the source of these stories. And it's important for you to educate yourself, like as Adam has said, have an open mind and educate yourself, uh, promote diversity. Um, do not repeat this perpetual uh, negative stereotype of these stories that are being shared in the media. Um, um, you know, and I think it's very important to um, tell you that even in, when it comes to publishing, there are gatekeepers. There are people that are preventing you from publishing. For myself, I chose self-publishing because it's very difficult to get publishing because who is the head of all these publishing companies? They're all, uh, you know, uh, white people that are, you know, the agents, uh, the editors, um, the publishers, you know what I mean? So it's very difficult for you to even get mainstream publishing. And the books that are traditionally published are the ones that are making into classrooms. They're the ones that are me uh, picked for uh, the libraries at school. So it's critical for us to invest in minority creative writers, creative uh, grassroots efforts um, in order for us to have the opportunity to learn directly from that community. Um, when we're having all these gatekeepers for the grants, for uh, the publishing, it's very difficult for us to tell our stories in an authentic way um, if we're not being given these opportunities. Um, I'm happy to say that I, uh, through my many, many, many efforts that I have been trying to do, that I am I'm gonna be traditionally published soon, which I'm happy to do that because I'm able to be sharing these stories on a greater platform. Um, as a self-published author, there are just places that I will never have access to just because the stigma of self-published uh, self authors do not have the push, the media, the funding, all of those things. Um, so I'm glad that I was able to do that, but it's also important to talk about um, the lack of opportunities for a lot of minor, minority artists, writers. Um, we are there, we're doing the actual work, um, but we lack funding, we lack recognition, we lack you know, opportunities and doors being open to us. Uh, Sonny uh, is, is watching and says schools don't teach about atrocities, plain and simple. I mean, I mean, how many people, how many Canadian students know that Ukrainians and, and, and Japanese Canadians were forced uh, into internment camps? I mean, how many people know about Alberta's history with eugenics and that Alberta's famous five promoted eugenics? Uh, that from Sonny. Nancy's watching right now. She says, my kids are in virtual school right now, high school and university. But when they're done, I'm going to make them watch this tonight. Nancy says, this is so good. Mr. Cynic is watching, says, I knew about residential schools and, and the stuff that happened there. But the 60s scoop I only learned about in the past few years. Eileen says, we haven't even spoken today about the original uprooting of our first peoples from their land, hauling them off to reservations. This is a disgusting history that needs to be talked about. I mean, the list here goes on. It's incredible, the impact. I mean, Jeff says, I've just learned this morning that empathy requires a suspension of judgment. Jean Barkley's watching. Uh, she's a, a, a counselor in Innisfail, uh, just uh, just uh, south of Red Deer. She says another great segment. Our municipal council took 10 hours of training how to become an ally, how to identify unconscious bias. It was truly eye-opening and the best 10 hours, says Councillor Barkley, that I ever could have spent. I mean, the, the list goes on. We don't have time to read all of them, but this is really remarkable. I want to just give a huge thank you to author uh, Rahma Mohammed, uh, to Adam North Pagan, and to Dr. Farha Sharif, who joined us on her daughter's birthday. We so appreciate you taking the time for us, the three of you. This has been a remarkable investment of our time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. us. 
Now, friends, uh, as you have been taking this in, we want to remind you that now you have the power to amplify the message that we've heard from these three remarkable people. You can share the link to our podcast. You can encourage people you know to subscribe to our podcast and make sure that you also subscribe to our YouTube channel and ring that bell. You can share the link around. I'll be posting uh, some of the highlights from these interviews on Twitter later today. Make sure the people that need to hear these messages are hearing these messages. And thank you for being part of this conversation. Uh, conversations like this would not happen with the support, uh, without the support of our remarkable sponsors, including the team at Park Power. Park Power powers the Real Talk RJ hashtag, which we've been monitoring through this morning's show. Uh, amazing comments from Ali and Kim. I mean, Ali right now says, what an incredible conversation on racism. The speakers are bang on. We needed to hear what they're saying. It gets the morning fire going. That on the Real Talk RJ hashtag. Park Power's been in the game since 2013. They provide natural gas, electricity, and internet. And when they make their profits, they share them with local charities. What better reason do you need? I mean, they've also got the local call center, the local customer service, and they're sponsors of Real Talk. So why not consider giving them your business? The same thing goes for St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Now we know that we're right into winter. Now there's no denying it. Someone's going to tweet at me and say, technically we're not into winter yet. You're not wrong, but tell that to people that are traveling the highways and those secondary highways and even the residential streets that haven't yet been plowed Doing it all in a Jeep with its legendary four-wheel drive is an experience into itself. And the team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge have your best Jeep selection anywhere in Alberta. It's a priority of theirs, so go talk to Scott and his team today. While you're out and about, if you're looking to lighten the load, you know we're one week away from Christmas Day. That's right, last night was one week until Christmas Eve. If you've got so much on your plate right now and you're looking for a way to just take off some of the stress, why not place a call to your local Friesen Brothers? They're open right now in 14 Alberta communities. They're 15th, set to open in the early spring in South Edmonton. They've got a team of Red Seal chefs and they're doing prepared Christmas dinners. So whether it's just you and someone else, whether it's you and your immediate family that could be six or eight people, they've got you covered at Friesen Brothers, Alberta Grown, and Alberta owned. And of course, you know how we wrap our show every Friday with a little rock and roll presented by the team at Local Waste. For 25 years, they've been in the game of waste management, including recycling. And of course, the team at Local Waste is the proud presenter of a legendary weekly segment we like to call Trash Talk. Now, you can submit your rants, raves, gripes, and celebrations to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We take a read through them. We pick up the best ones, and it leads us to this moment. Sam, are we ready to rock and roll? Let's get into it. All right, from the Trash Talk email folder, viewers of Real Talk are chiming in, and that includes Sal, who says, hey, I get it. COVID's been hard on everybody. We know that. Retail workers, we're doing our best. Sal says, I'm a proud retailer. I've enjoyed a decent life because of what I do. Most years, as we get closer to the holidays, people are generally wonderful and kind. Some aren't. There are those who are downright nasty. Like to remind people like me that we're there to serve people like them. They have no issues reminding us there's a reason we work retail. Guys like me, we work retail because it's what we're qualified for. Most years I brush off the comments. The majority of people are amazing. But this year, with the restriction on how we're serving our customers, it feels like people are more willing to tell us how terrible we are. I've had multiple phone calls dealing with people who want to remind us how precious their time is when we weren't able to let them into the store because of capacity limits. Those same people willing to waste half an hour of their time to to tell me what an inconvenience it was. I know our team, you know, we're not unique. And you can hear stories from every corner of retail, especially this year. Okay, he says, most of these incidences are shitty, but they're not common. My rant here, just a reminder, we're trying to make a living. We are trying our best. We're at the same risk as everybody else serving the general public. Just be kind. That from Sal. This from Kim. Kim says, just while I stepped in it on Twitter for commenting, you shouldn't have guests who have a habit of blocking Albertans. She's talking about David Staples. She says, but the thing is, Ryan, it's infuriating when journalists and politicians block citizens of the province simply passionate about holding them to the basic standard of telling the truth. 
She says, I'm not talking about bots, trolls, or provocateurs. I'm talking about people like me and thousands of others who are simply sick to death of being gaslit by people with platforms, people willing to say something about it. It's not personal, says Kim. It affects the entire narrative of our province, and it's dangerous. Giving platform, Ryan, to bad actors who live in silos, they don't handle disagreements well, and they can't listen to well-intentioned Albertans is something you should not be doing. There are other fabulous people in this province across the spectrum I'd love to hear from instead. Choose them, Ryan. Choose them. That from Kim, who went on to let me know. She also signed up put her money where her mouth is, and she's supporting us on Patreon. Thanks, Kim. We've got a special announcement for you early next week. And here's my trash talk for the week. I guess in a way it has a little something to do with what Sal said. Kind of, sort of. Now, it feels weird to say this with rock and roll behind us, but let this be a perspective check. Yesterday, Dr. Dina Hinshaw announced 30 more deaths in the province of Alberta. That brings us to 790 Albertans who will not see the holidays this year or any other year because they passed away due to COVID-19. 117 in Canada yesterday, 30 were from Alberta, more than 13,900 Canadians have lost their lives. I know you're considering breaking the rules. I know you're saying nobody's going to stop you from seeing your family this Christmas. I know you're wanting to hit the ODR, go snowshoeing with your friends, head out to the hotels, mix and mingle and find loopholes wherever you can. But this is serious. We need to cap this. And despite what some political leaders are watching over their shoulders are saying, we have not stopped the curve. We're still into one and health professionals keep telling us. So let's get serious about COVID-19. And that's Trash Talk! Sam, we just perfectly timed that out for the first time I, in our entire lives. I mean, we didn't get to see you air guitar. Did you want me to put it back on? So no! You, you have your regular? I've been trying to perfectly time it out every <laughs> single time we've done it. And we just did it, everybody! What a moment! <laughs> and what a week. Sam Brooks's laugh will bring joy to anybody in close proximity or even I, further away from that. What a show today. Previous to this job, I didn't know I had a distinctive laugh. That's that's actually... Come on, nobody, honestly, t- nobody told you you have a distinctive yeah, laugh? I, I don't know. I actually haven't said much today. Uh, how's it going? This was a monster show. This oh, was man. a monster show. You know, uh, uh, Minister Jonathan Wilkinson talking about the carbon tax, the, 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 the plan. You know who I was really impressed? I was really impressed with James the Farmer. Uh, who wrote in and sent us that email? He says, "Hey, listen, I'm a, you know, he he and his family farm. He's also an engineer." I read his email like three times, right? When I got it, yeah. Because here's the thing: it's not like you know, I don't want to put uh, emails in front of uh, federal ministers that are like, you know, hey, libtard, you know, what about socks and hair and true dope and all the in Hillary's emails and G5 and what about the carbon tax? Like, we're not going to get interviews with federal ministers if we pull that kind of crap. But this guy brought his email to the table it, it was wise it was insightful it, it was he came from a position of, of real education um i thought that was the one answer and we were trying to get in as many questions as we could in the 20 minutes we had with i thought that was the one answer he didn't really quite adequately uh, adequately address we said what are we going to do for farmers specifically with grain drying and he said that's something that we're willing to look at yeah he, he talked about I think parallel to a lot of sort of the upgrades that people are making in their homes and whatnot, he talked about trying to create incentives for high efficiency grain dryers and stuff like that. But I, I agree it was a bit of a it was a bit of a non answer. Um Yeah. I, I think you know what's interesting is like sometimes I try to our show bounces around all over the place. And uh, sometimes I try to find, you know, like a theme that goes through all it. And I think I think the theme through today's show is, is make yourself uncomfortable. Isn't that great? You know what I mean? Because like when we talk about climate change, which like, by the way, I won't do it today. But if you want me to get on a soapbox about something, let's talk about climate change. Well, what do you um, want? What do you want? Can, can you do it in under a minute? <laughs> um, in under a minute, we don't give it the seriousness that it deserves. That's that's the entirety of my thesis. Um, I firmly believe that. An embracement of change and being willing to be uncomfortable and being willing to transition to technology and like shift our manufacturing sector, shift our exports, shift our things to to technologies of the future and things that people want to have is going to put us like not only in a healthier planet, but actually in a more prosperous economic future. You know, my my biggest gripe with Alberta is that we sell a product that the world doesn't want anymore. Well, that's and, I'm going to disagree. Yeah, you know what I mean? OK, that's I'm fine. Disagree that's fine. There. Yeah, no, the world want the world wants and needs oil 
and gas. The I world don't, I wants don't think, and needs oil as a as a way to get us to the future we need to be in. Sure, and 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 we are transitioning. Yeah, See, I'm not a I I'm not a per. Oh boy. Okay, here we go. Uh, are we going to go till noon today? You um, know what's funny is what I actually had teed up for end remarks was all about the panel, <laughs> and then we started talking about Minister I, Wilkinson. I, and, and, we, yeah. and we'll leave. I, I, with respect to Minister Wilkinson, yeah. the highlight of the show was our panel. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think um, he would agree with that. I, I think he would probably. Well, and and you know what was amazing is I if I can find this, uh, uh, Moira is. Um, uh, where is it? Gosh. Anyway, his, his one of his chiefs of staff or his communications uh, like out of Ottawa um, just tweeted from her personal account that she tuned in. She said to watch her boss, uh, Environment Minister, Environment and Climate Change Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, and she stuck around for the whole show. She said that was a remarkable panel. So oh, I wow. thought that that was pretty high praise, which was awesome as well. Um, it also means that the Environment Minister w- was probably without his chief comm staff for about an hour while she was glued to the screen watching <laughs> Real Talk, which is awesome. Um but uh, but I, 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 I won't say that the world doesn't want oil and gas anymore. And I think the world is going to need oil and gas mm-hmm. for the next, who knows, 30 to 50 years. Um, but we are transitioning. And I think Alberta would be wise to reflect that in the investments that government makes and, in, in, and, and with some of our entrepreneurial ventures as well. And that is happening. Uh, maybe not from a government standpoint quite yet with regards to priorities, but certainly industry responds. I mean, that's what a, an astute business person does. Yeah, I, I think right now it's more of a need than a want. That's that's my thing. It's just like, you know, we've built oil has given us so much prosperity. Like if you think about it, the entire industrial revolution would not have happened without some form of a steam engine, then an internal combustion engine. And just the fact that we have a ready portable source of fuel that we can move around is what created the modern world. Nobody can deny that. But I think that we've transitioned to a spot where we are so handcuffed to our need for oil that we're scared of looking at other technologies and we need to transition that need, the core need for energy to different types of energy as we move off of fossil fuels. Yeah, I like to I, I kind of like that we wind down the show like this and have a minute. We check in with each other. We check in with the audience. Um, can you call up Premier's tweet from yesterday? We used it in the newscast at nine o'clock just to show people this. Is, this was yesterday from from Jason Kenny and, and um, Judy is chiming in and, and saying essentially, you know, she'd kind of like to hear about uh, Kenny's referendum set up to bring out more right wing votes. Uh, to upset municipal elections. This from the premier yesterday. Um, as Dr. Dean Hinshaw was talking about 30 dead with COVID, Jason Kenny, talk, Kenny talking about um, equalization and, and all of the things that nobody is talking about. Uh, he says, absent is our request for fairness and a retroactive equalization rebate through fiscal stabilization. Basically, Ottawa turns its back on Alberta when we need support. Um, more on that in a second. And he says, you know, we'll be asked, we'll be holding a referendum to scrap equalization from the Constitution in October 2021. Albertans demand a fair deal from Ottawa. Uh, we won't give up that fight. First of all, uh, Jason Kenney is one of the architects of the equalization formula. So don't let him Correct. forget that. Talk to your MLAs, uh, email your MLAs, call your MLAs, call your ministers, uh, send emails to the premier's office. Nobody will forget. We're not idiots. We're not stupid. We don't have short memories that Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney as a senior cabinet minister are responsible for Canada's current equalization formula. So that's the most important point. Second most important point is that this referendum is pure political theater and a waste of money. And Judy is right to a certain extent. I think that by putting that referendum on the municipal ballot in fall of 2021 who is going to be most motivated to scrap the current equalization formula probably people that believe everything else that jason kenny tells them and who are those people probably going to vote for in municipal elections probably candidates that are appointed or celebrated or supported either publicly or privately with the dark money that's now allowed by the premier's office and by jason kenny so we see through this and we will continue to talk about this but just remember the referendum will accomplish exactly zero and it's going to cost albertans a lot of money and it makes no sense be vocal about it be fearless about it speak your mind and speak truth to power so that's pretty much all i have to say about that right now judy except for the fact that i would expect a political leader to probably display a little bit more empathy when alberta saw its first death toll higher than 29 in other words the first time we saw 30 from dr dina hinshaw and the premier's talking about a referendum next fall to rejig the equalization formula that he and stephen harper are responsible for talk about tone deaf there it is 30 deaths 790 of them that's alberta's deaths 
uh, due to COVID-19 in Canada, 13,956 people have died. And by the way, while we're at it, I know that this sounds like trash talk continued, but this is really bothering me that governments or government authorities or health authorities are starting to list the numbers of comorbidities along with these deaths. I even saw it the other day where Alberta included, Alberta Health Services in its numbers, the average age of a person who has died from COVID-19. Midweek, by the way, that average age was 82. Now, we understand what that's really saying without saying it, right? Can I just say it? They're old. They they're were old, gonna, they're going to die anyway. They're going to die anyway. Yep. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's why you include that data. That's why you do it. Comorbidities, like Julie Rohr talked to us about in the first week of Real Talk. I think it was the first Wednesday we were on the air. She joined us. She says, I have comorbidities. Uh, she's fighting, I think it's sarcoma. It's a very rare form of cancer. Like one in a million people will fight it or something like that. She says, so what? She's like, I'm in my 30s. I have kid. I have a family. I- I'm a mother. I have comorbidities. So so what? Does that make my death any less consequential? Does it make it any less tragic? Does it make it more acceptable? Don't tolerate this bullshit. We'll keep calling it out. And we'll keep doing shows starting again next Monday morning. Just a few days from now, we're going to tell you our holiday schedule. We're, we're going to take the stats. We're going to take Christmas Day and New Year's Day off. But we're going to bring you broadcasts every other day, including Christmas Eve morning and The New Year's Eve morning show is going to be a special one. And we're going to tell you more about that on Monday. Make it a great weekend, my friends. Thank you for sticking around here into, well, this is the overtime of overtime. We're going longer now, I think, than we ever have because we've got so much to talk about and we're not constrained, really, by anything. Thanks for being a part of the Real Talk audience. Make sure you share the interviews that you've seen and we will talk to you again Monday morning at 8.30 Mountain Time at ryanjesperson.com.